Arsenal Hassel. Okay, uh, today we are joined by uh, Jeff Thompson. And, you know, I was, I was thinking about how to do this introduction and even saying uh, a legend of, the, of British martial arts or a legend of the martial arts, I feel kind of didn't do it justice. Uh, so just before, just before we, we kick in, one of the things that I wanted to say at the very beginning was that we, we started the podcast and we called it the Marshall Focus Podcast. And I really wanted to concentrate on, on martial artists and, and about the martial arts side of things. But what I found is straight away is that the, the people's actual stories, the, their life seems to be where the actual learning is uh, and, and much more uh, interesting and, and, and where we can get stuff from, even over and above the, the years of martial arts training. And to have someone like yourself on the podcast today, you kind of, you fill that category in abundance. Uh, so let's start nice and simple. Uh, how have things been for you over the last couple of months and, and during the pandemic? I know that you've got a lot of projects and things going on at the minute. Yeah, I, kind of, I was kind of prepared in a way because I've had about five years of exile. I, I kind of exiled myself for about five years and wrote some new books, uh, went through some uh, regenerative experiences. Um, and just, just as I was coming out of my exile, the, the world went into exile. <laughs> yeah. So I was kind of up and running. I was okay. I live a very private life anyway. Yeah. Um, you know, it's just me and Sharon here. I've got my kids living quite locally, but, but it, it's, um, so it wasn't foreign to me. And, yeah. you know, it's very, it, this, this flood we're experiencing, I would, I would consider this to be a flood. You yeah. Know, like yeah. from, you know, the, the, like a, uh, Noah, you know, the Old Testament. Floods always happen when there needs to be a cleansing, when there needs to be regeneration. So I just had, I just had five years of that. I'd had five years where God said to me, uh, build an ark, go inside the eye wall, stay there. Yep. Um, and I didn't. I did what Noah did. I built an ark and I said, yeah, I've built the ark. I'll have a little wander around. And yep. uh, what God did with Noah was he showed him death in the crowd in the market and Noah... He ran to the ark yeah. and, and uh, the door was open and he went inside. So basically it's saying, find the singularity, find the center point, that's your ark, stay in it because we're going to flood, we're going to flood everything. Um, there's going to be a plague or a fire or a flood and we're going to get rid of everything that isn't clean. Yeah. So I've, I've just gone through that. And then as I've come out of that and, and, the, and the byproduct of that was the two books I've just written. Um, as I come out of that, it was like the backlash of it. I saw it starting to happen in the world. Um, so I was kind of already gemmed up for it. And I understood, I understood metaphysically what was happening. Yeah. It was not just a matter of uh, there's a virus and nobody really understands. I, I did understand. And if you come from, I, I, mean, I suppose, any of the faiths, really, you know, it's deeply embedded in Judaism, in Islam, it's deeply embedded in Christianity you know Zoroastra it's deeply embedded in Hinduism um, in Sikhism it's, it's in all of them it's in all of our prophecies that every now and again there is a there will be a, a flood which will be followed by a regeneration will, which will be followed by a new birth so so I've come out of that um, I always say to Sharon my wife I said yeah, I feel like we're two kids on a tea tray going down a snowy hill like that because <laughs> you know, there's <laughs> So much going on at the moment because I've obviously brought these two books out and I've been pretty quiet for a while. Uh, so I've been doing lots and lots of interviews. My instruction is just to plant as many seeds as possible. Yep. Those seeds will act as little portals for people um, uh, so that they can, maybe they'll enter through a podcast, maybe they'll enter through a quote or a book and it will, it will take them on a, an avenue of learning or an avenue of, uh, inquiry so my job is just to do that not to worry too much about where it goes but uh, and the interviews I take are very it's very much intuitive your interview request came through and it was just uh, full of 
politeness and love and I just it was it was obvious I just wanted to come and do it oh wow thank you uh, even just listening to you talk already and just for those those sort of kind words uh, I need to try my best to hold this one together today because <laughs> I, I, it's uh, I, I really want I really want to give you another opportunity to to just share your story uh, I'm I'm 38 and uh, I guess, I think your life story has, has been out there, but maybe I was a bit young and stupid and maybe not ready for it at the time. To me, you were always this, it was the martial arts only part that I sort of followed for many years. Uh, and then as I say, you did, you, you, you disappeared. Even doing research, a wee bit of research for the podcast, uh, going on to your, your website and it's really just a, a landing page now saying I'm not doing this sort of stuff anymore yeah, yeah. Uh, but then as I say maybe as I matured a little and having someone like yourself who had sort of looked up to so much my my avenues of inquiry changed and it wasn't just about uh, your knockout power or the stories of you on the doors or your karate skills. Maybe I was ready to start looking into what actually made this man the man that he is. Uh, so I know you've done this a million times now, but if we can go all the way back to your sort of childhood and yeah. then discuss through your life that's, that's brought you to this point, because I think just people in my audience hearing your story is, is, is education enough because there's so many things, so many things to learn. So you, you were born in Coventry, I believe. And yes, what, I was your, what was your early life like? I was born up um, a Catholic Christian, Catholic Christian schools, Catholic Irish. Um, I didn't really understood what, understand what that meant. But even at a young age, I, under, I, I didn't understand it. But uh, the fact that I didn't understand it meant I understood it. Because yeah. I was sitting in the church and I, and I automatically could see incongruence. Not that, I, not that there wasn't incongruence in me, of course there was, but I looked in the church and I thought, oh, I know all these people. And these words are great. I mean, you know, I didn't understand the poetry. I didn't understand the exegesis, you know, the explanation of it. I only, it was only the revealed religion. But I knew enough to know that the kids that were in there weren't living this they weren't even trying to live it you know they walked outside and it was abandoned immediately yep. so it was this i knew that already i understood it and that's what i understood also when i went into the martial arts i understood that um, even my masters even the guys i idolized were um most of them a lot of them brilliant technicians but and all of them talking Buddha, but, and this isn't a criticism, this is absolutely an observation because yeah. I bumped into it myself later, but they weren't living Buddha. No, you can't be sleeping with your students and hiding your tax under the bed in a tin um, yeah. and bullying your students um, and, and pretending that's Buddha. You know, you can't, you can't kill people 200 times a day with your tongue gossiping over a coffee in Costa and call that Buddha. If you can't even control your own, um, you know, your own palate, you've got no chance of controlling anything metaphysical. So I understood that as well. So I was a, I was a kid that was destined to do something, and the, but I would include everybody in that. I think that's our, all of our potential. But I had this massive energy, and of course, like a lot of people, I, I went into martial arts thinking. Uh, you know, this is my avenue. But within the first year of training, I got groomed and sexually abused by the teacher I was training with. So there's two things happened there for me, Karim. One is that uh, you, I was taught that you can't trust people, not even the people you love, especially the people you love. Yeah. This isn't true, but this is what I was taught. Yeah. That became a, a parasite, a cognition. I also understood that my path was destined to be uh, of service. My path was to go out and have the courage to confront fear, dissolve fear, convert, convert fear into love. I can do that. Um, and uh, my, my uh, dharma was to go out and um, break down boundaries, expand, you know, and 
pass all of that learning on to other people, have the courage to go and put it on a pl public platform, have the courage to bring out all the things I'm afraid of and put them on a public platform and show people that it's possible to overcome these things. So the reason, the reason my journey was sabotaged within the first year was, was because I was destined to do great things. And so there were, energies, there were energies around me that were trying to block that at the age of 11. So again, we, it, this is what, if, if you listen to the story of, um, have, you ever, have you ever looked at the, I don't know if you've looked at the, uh, the, the Srimad Bhagavatam, the Hindu, the the Hindu, Hindu epic. epic. It's, a, it's a 24 volume epic. It comes from the Vedas. But the 10th canto is about the birth of uh, Krishna. In other words, the birth of consciousness. Okay. And it says when Krishna was born, King Kamsa, who represented the ego, sent 12 demons. <clears throat> to kill him while he was still embryonic, while he was still young. They wanted to, <clears throat> excuse me, they wanted to kill him to stop him from expanding consciousness because the prophecy was once, con once Krishna was born, King Kamsa was dead, his reign was over. Yeah. So I, un so I understand looking back now that, that these demons and divides, these shadows were sent to sabotage my story within the first year of it beginning so that I wouldn't go out, so that it would implant a parasite of fear that would trigger massive terror every time I got to the, um, the periphery of uh, my borders. So I've only recognized that in retrospect. In fact, I'm talking to you now, that's the first, this is the first time I've actually recognized that point. Yeah. <clears throat> talking to you now, and this is why uh, sharing things is good because you learn as much about things yourself, you yeah. know, as, the person you're talking to <coughs> excuse me this is no this this here is no um coincidence either something's trying to block me from uh revealing the truth so that's good this is all good signs yeah <laughs> so it got sabotaged within the first year so i knew that but that put me off martial arts it meant i couldn't trust people it, it developed uh it, what happened when this guy abused me was he stole something from me. He stole an innocence. He stole my light or a bit of my soul. Yeah. And in its place, he put a parasite, a guard. And this parasite or this cognition or this belief would trigger fear every time I tried to do something extraordinary with my life. It triggered massive terror, more so with me because I knew I was destined and that my dharma was to present to a bigger audience. Anyway, I did end up going back into the martial arts, but this parasite was in, was in place. So I was psychotically jealous as an adult. I was um, uh, no self-esteem at all. I self-harmed. I sexually self-harmed. <clears throat> I couldn't even control my own hands. I didn't consciously know this. I just thought this, I just, I didn't even recognize that this was going on consciously. I just knew it was how, how I was living and it filled me with deep, deep shame. Mm -hmm. Shame, dissonance, or, you know, all sorts of uh, all sorts of um, fearful emotions. Shame being the ma the main one. So this guy sabotaged my journey very early on. He stole my soul or a part of it <clears throat> and replaced it with a parasite or the hot coals of abuse. Um, because I was too afraid, <clears throat> because of the shame to share it, um, this parasite expanded in me. And as it expanded, it, it, my consciousness contracted. I, was, I just became very fearful. Lots of ambition, but too afraid to go and do anything with it. I could see that the things I wanted were within my reach, but they were beyond my grasp. Because the moment I got to the edge of, you know, uh, of the boundaries, this parasite would rise up and go, not you, not today. You're not worth it. You're a piece of shit. Even the people that love you abuse you. You know, it's terrifying out there. It's absolutely terrifying. You, you won't survive. You won't cope out there. You're a lightweight. I eventually did get back into martial arts. I went back into Shotokan. I forged ahead. <clears throat> but all of these things were in the background still. They were still there. I got married. I had children, but they were still in the background. So I got my wife. I got my beautiful kids. But privately, in my own time, I was self-abusing. I was sexually self-abusing. This created shame. Um, it, I recognized I had no autonomy, had no self-control, had no control of my will. So something had climbed in <clears throat> at the age of 11 and stolen my autonomy. 
in the Old Testament, they say, enter the kingdom, enter the land, you know, seek the kingdom of God and all other things will come to you. Um, the, the root word for land is will. So when he says enter the land, enter the kingdom, enter Canaan, it's saying enter the will. When you enter the will, all the other things will come to you. Yeah. This person has stolen my will. I had to retrieve it. I had to retrieve it. So anyway, I didn't realize what was going on. So I built myself into this monster with all my, with all my war paint. Yeah. And uh, as a pretty little kid, got rid of all the prettiness, got all the, the cauliflower, the broken nose, bulbous knuckles, yeah. um, a, a huge wing back. And, and I could knock people out in 30 different languages. So yeah. I built this up. What, what happened before that was I... Because this, this situation had been unresolved, this parasite was resident in me. I wasn't conscious of it. But it, every time I wanted to do something, it kept triggering um, depression. The depressions would come into my life and literally like three gangsters turning up at the door and wiping my life out for three or four months at a time. Yeah. And then when they wandered off, they would be like, yeah, you know, my name's depression. Uh, see you again next week or see you again next year. The feeling was, you can never get rid of me. It's a lie, but that was the feeling. On this last particular depression, I got young kids, I was married, I was waking up at four in the morning in a cold sweat, and it's a long day, and you're thinking, how am I going to get through? How will I get through this day? There's no one I can go to, because the books I'm reading aren't telling the truth. They're not telling me, they're not telling me that this is illusory, that this can be overcome. The doctor's offering me tablets. Um, my wife is frightened of me because I've become sheepish and puppy-like and afraid. I don't even want to leave the house. And I'm following around the house like a puppy. So she's afraid of me. She's afraid of the depression. She's afraid that it might leap out and catch her. We'd know, we weren't talking about mental health at that time. Yeah. And I just, I would say this is my first major or conscious um, communication with the soul i just had this flash of rage this flash of courage from somewhere and it came with an idea um in kabbalah they would call it hokama hokama means wisdom so you have a little seed of wisdom and god said here's a little seed of wisdom unpack it all 10 spherots of the tree of life are in this seed God is contained, all of God, the omniscient, the omnipotent, the omnipresent is contained in this seed of an idea. Your job is to unpack it, and to expand it, and to deepen it, and to take it out. And for the next 40 years, talk about it so that you understand it more and more. Because there's a lot here to understand, Jeff. There's a lot to understand. So this wisdom, draw a pyramid on a piece of paper, write down all your fears, least fear on the bottom step, Worst fear on the top step. Then confront them one by one until there are no fears left. That became my fear pyramid. Um, so I systematically started to look at everything I was afraid of. And it was obviously at the beginning, it was all the placeholders, you know, like spiders, dentists, going into a karate tournament. Um, but when I started to confront those things and intercourse with them, they dissolved. Some of them dissolved as soon as I looked at them. Some of them dissolved the moment I ripped them down on the pyramid and exposed them to light. Some of them, you know, put up a bit of a fight. Yep. And I had to confront several times, you know, before I was able to overcome them. Um, but overcome them I did. And, you know, in the meantime, as these fears were overcome, they were revealing deeper fears. I wasn't just afraid of a spider in the bath. I was afraid of marital confrontation. I was afraid of confronting my wife who I, who I had allowed to become a bully. She's a beautiful girl, but I'd, I'd allowed her to become very dominant. So I was very afraid of her. I was afraid of my mom. I was afraid of abandonment. Mm. Um, in Judaism, they would call this, the, they would call the mother figure the Sheshna. Um, so I was afraid, it wasn't like I was afraid of her as a person. I was afraid of losing or being dominated by this female mm. aspect, by this female side of me. So I started to recognize that I was frightened of change. I was frightened of success. I didn't even know what success was, Karim. I don't, what is success? I've never even looked at it. I just dreamed of it. And success to me was 
you know, some wild random anomaly, you know, somebody gets a, a seven figure deal for their first book or somebody wins seven figures on the lottery or, the, yeah. or, or whatever. Um, but we never, ever examined this. So when I put, when I put fear of success on my fear pyramid, fear of success was like, well, what if you are successful? What if you did publish a book? What's, how's your wife going to feel when you when you've gone from Jeff, the factory worker to being on, Richard and Judy live or Sky News live or in the newspaper and you're bringing all the dirty washing out and you're showing it to people. What are you going to do? You're going to bring attention to the door. You're going to bring shame to the door. So you suddenly start to think, I'm, I'm, I don't know what success is. So, so my fear pyramid was saying to me or my intuition was saying to me, you know, show me your schematic. What is success? What do you want to do? Where do you want to be? Of course, I realized I just wanted to write. I didn't really know what to write about. I had nothing to write about. Every time I sat down, my pen was dry. So I started to realize I was afraid of change. You know, because even if, even if they brought somebody new in at work, I was disturbed by this new energy because what if they were confrontational? You know, what if, what if I didn't like them? You know, what if every eight hours every day I'm stood with somebody I hate? Or, um, I recognize, but I recognized that change was the only constant. But I was afraid of it. And I also looked around me and thought, well, everybody's afraid of it. The society is quietly hypnotized to go in one direction. Anybody that steps out of that direction, everybody stops and notices them. Yeah. What's he doing? Who does he yeah. think he is? Let's pull him down. <laughs> yeah. So I did the fear pyramid. I got to the top of the pyramid. And my, my final fear was a fear of violent confrontation. Um, so, you know. What As I've said many times. What age would you have been then? What age was I that? would be in my early 20s by this time. Right, okay. Young family. Um, tremendous problems with depression. It was, a, it was a, an assassin for me. It would just turn up once it came. I knew once it came, I wouldn't be able to get rid of it for a long time. This final, when I did the fear pyramid, what it says to me is, um, if it's intermittent, if it comes and goes, it's not real. It's not constant. What is constant can't be threatened. What is constant is there all the time. It doesn't change. So if this rises up and then goes away, it's because it's not real. And I had to look at that, but it, it, won't, it won't give up its tendency. It won't give up its lie until you absorb 99% of it. This is from Ushiba, Moria Ushiba, founder of Aikido. If you get a chance to look him up, he's an amazing guy. He's, he's still my idol, still my ideal of a martial artist. He went from very, very physical martial arts. Uh, um, he went very deeply, he, he trained with a guy called uh, Anusabura Debuchi, who was a kind of a high priest in Japan. So he trained in the esoteric end and he went very deep into that. Um, and he really, really tested the boundaries. He's a guy that properly went into Budo. He wasn't like dream catchers and socks and sandals, you know, it's proper, you know, yeah. life and death Budo. Yeah. Um, um, and he says you've got to absorb 99% of it before it will give up its tendency. And then this, what happens is when you intercourse with it, when you turn into it instead of turning away, this three-dimensional monster becomes a two-dimensional cartoon. And when you stay with it, it dissipates. Not just, not just dissipates. And this is what happened to Krishna as a child. Each, each demon that he fought, he defeated them. The nature of the demon was liberated and the effulgence that was locked in the demon came over to Krishna and he expanded. Mm -hmm. And he, he, did this, uh, he did this with each demon until eventually he faced King Kamta himself, who would represent the Satan or represent the, yeah. the prime ego. Yeah. So he, and, when he, and you know what he did when he met with Kamta? They wrestled. <laughs> 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 you know, and it's very like Jacob's ladder when Jacob climbed yeah. the ladder and wrestled with the angel. It's uh, the the angel and the Satan or the or the um, or the ego. They're allegories. They represent they yeah. they represent the fact that we uh, wrestle internally with our um, dark thoughts, our false beliefs, our cognitions, our wounds, our scars. In the Holy Quran. Um, Muhammad would call this the greater jihad. The lesser jihad is when we roll up our sleeves and try and fight the world. 
yeah. the growth we have is when we go inside and the wrestle is all internal. So that's which is a hugely uh, misconstrued and, and there's a big misconception about the terms he had because he yeah. over the last twenty years and uh, a lack of education about what the, the term actually yeah. means. Uh, Very true. W- w- one of the things that I, I, from from all the videos that I've watched over the last couple of days and, and just speaking to you at the moment, uh, I always find that social media is full of, and obviously you've not been on for, for a number of years and uh, we're, we're in this Excel without even a sort of website, etc. but everything's just, everything's words nowadays. And there must be so many people out there that are facing depression and anxiety and fear. I, I, I kept writing down the word fear when I was yeah. taking notes. And we, we, we think just by seeing a nice picture on Facebook and some nice words, and then, it, oh, that makes me feel better for a day. And then it comes back and people never beat it. But what's coming across for you in everything that I've watched and read is that you actually you you actually faced it? There, yeah. there, there was a and continue to face it. Of course, of course. But what the point I'm trying to stress is is the you actually faced it. You 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 said no. You didn't yeah. say, "Well, oh, this will get me by till next week," or "This will get me by till then." You actually faced it. So. Let's pick it up when when I would have been more aware of you and, and the the person that I would have been more aware of before, obviously, reading up in recent years. But uh, how did that fear manifest itself to the time when you became a a doorman and this world famous martial arts forward slash hard man? And I don't mean that in a dis- I certainly don't yeah, mean no. in a disrespectful. We, uh, how, how did that come about? Well, my final fear on the pyramid was a fear of violent confrontation. So I took a job as a nightclub bouncer. It just was logical to me. It's, I know it's, it's extreme to most people, but by this time I changed jobs. My confidence was growing. I was running classes. I was starting to, to teach my concept of fear pyramid. Yep. I was starting to motivate people. Um, and I realized that I'd, I'd got these physical skills, but I still didn't really know what worked, what didn't work. I didn't understand the physical confrontation. I only knew that what I was being taught wouldn't work in the kind of fights I'd seen. Mm-hmm. And even at the age of 15, when I was a purple belt, I can remember being in a pub and watching a fight and knowing that what we were learning, even though it was a tough system and it was... Um, you know, it was a very physical system. I knew it would not fit into that kind of yeah. um, wacky races type of fight, you know, with legs and arms coming out of clouds, you know. I yeah. knew it wouldn't fit. I just knew it wouldn't. And, of course, every time I had all of these skills and they were, they were I was a good club player, you know, um, to, but they were quite impressive. Uh, but every time my endocrine system kicked off and I got adrenaline, I just wanted to run. Yeah. And then I'd feel tremendous shame because I'm thinking, what's wrong with me? I'd... I feel terrified and I would doubt everything I'd got. So going on the door was about overcoming that fear of violence because I didn't understand it and trying to find out what was true, what was real. Because I'm, I'm, I was around masters. I was around guys that I idolised. But there were 20 of them all, all telling me different things. It can't all be right. Yeah, yeah. And, and, you know, I was looking at it and just thinking, I don't know how this would work in the way I'm being shown. And, of course, we've been brought up on you know, on exaggerations of martial arts. Yeah. And obviously we have to be shown the exaggerations in order to understand the subtle. But, you know, you're showing stuff that even the people showing it are quietly saying, well, this wouldn't work in a real fight. This is, you know, this is, you know, for, this is for celluloid purposes. Mm-hmm. But of course, we, we didn't listen to that. We just watched yeah. the, 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 the nice stuff. So I went on the door and it was a revelation because I just thought, what worked was obvious. The environment grabbed you. The environment was a living, and the, was a living being, mm-hmm. or a series of living beings, or a collection of living beings. And if you went in, if you had the courage to go into the environment, the environment, like your soul, became your teacher. The environment would go, "Don't need that. Don't need that. That's superfluous. 
that's okay for competitions, that's good for recreation, that's very good for art. It's not going to work outside the chip shop on a Friday night. Yeah. You will die here. People die in these encounters. So the, the, my, I went into life and death situations. I know that often sounds like an exaggeration, but as I've said many times, four of my friends were murdered during the time I worked as a bouncer. Yeah. And I saw lots of maimings, lots of stabbings, you know, and th there's obviously a lot more people killed as well, but four of them were personal friends of mine and they died violent deaths. So it was very real. You know, we were dealing with uh, gangsters, we were dealing with um, violent criminals, we were dealing with um, people with massive amounts of displacement, just ordinary factory workers yeah. who come out on a Friday night and would displace a bad week or a bad month or a bad marriage or a bad year or a bad life into whatever um, authority figures were around. Yeah, and that sure. was us, especially if you was in your early 20s, balding, um, tremendously good looking, Absolutely. Um, <laughs> I feel your pain. <laughs> I, feel your pain. Articulate, I was articulate. So, you know, everybody wanted to have a pop at me. But the environment just, the environment was amazing. The environment, you have to listen to the environment. I mean, I, I saw many people go in there, martial artists who wouldn't listen to the environment because the environment was dismissing their art mm -hmm. or the environment was disrespecting their art. And they were too afraid to listen to the environment. The environment said to me, that stuff won't work. You have to adapt it and make it work like this. You know, and it showed me immediately what worked. And it was, what worked was very simple. Preemption, artifice and preemption. It was savagely effective, but it meant, it took me ages to have the courage to watch videos of myself in real fights and just go, the stuff I'm learning doesn't fit here. Yeah. And I've got to let it go. And it's yeah. not a disrespect to my seniors it's not a disrespect to my art it's it's very respectful to myself and my students to go back and say we're doing this all wrong we've got to change this because this isn't going to work this isn't going to help you the big factor of course was fear because the moment you're faced with somebody who doesn't care whether you're a first down or a second down or desperate down they don't care yeah. they think it's conquerors if you're an eighth down and they beat you they're a ninth down yeah. you know what i mean they yeah. don't care that they don't they don't care what dan you are they want to they want to see the goods um so you are you are aware of that when you're there they don't even know you most of them so your reputation and all the rest of it doesn't even count yeah. remember rick young saying to me once me and rick were very good friends and he said to me your art needs to be so good that you you need you need to be able to walk into a room anonymously nobody know you and they know immediately your potency not because you're rick young or jeff thompson but because you hit a pad or hit a bag or you speak and the certainty rings yeah and that's very true the door was like that so what wasn't real fell away what was real made itself evident so i went back to my class and said we're doing this all wrong and that was the beginning of this new method of training animal day yeah line training three second fighting and i started to really hone it so that in itself was, was amazing, uh, but I, had to, I, I had literally had to absorb 99% of the fear before that revealed itself. When the environment knew I was going to stay, it taught me everything I wanted to learn. But the danger was I became intoxicated by it. Mm -hmm. I became drunk with it and I became a bully myself. I started to use my fists um, to solve problems that would have been better solved with over the table negotiation yeah this this what i learned on the doors was like magic career it was like magic it was like i was stood in front of somebody um and i was able to know how they were feeling know how to alter those feelings know how to climb inside them and and lift their adrenaline or drop their adrenaline or distract them i was able to hit them and knock them out before they even knew they was in a fight it was like magic. As long as I could control my endocrine system and, and by proxy control theirs, mm -hmm. I would get the first shot in. I'd know where to put it. I'd know how to put it. I'd know, I'd know how to prepare the ground for it. And I could take somebody out of the fight before they even knew they were in the fight. So it was like, it was like magic. It's like you knew something that they didn't know. That's why I always used to say to people, don't mess about with bouncers because they know something that you don't know. Yeah. So. I learned these skills, but I, 
because I was still developing, I misused them and I became violent. And, I, and because I've still got this parasite in me, although I built all this armory and I've learned this knowledge, I still got this massive insecurity in me, this child in me that was like going to be revealed at any moment, this terror. So it was through a, you know, obviously I stayed on the door for a long time. I started to teach it. I started to go in front of, a wider and wider audience, bigger and bigger teachers. Um, and I started to get interviewed for television, for newspapers. I started to bump into intellectuals who were saying, qualify this, very violent, qualify this. Yeah. And I was a very good talker, but, um, and obviously I was writing about this, but I couldn't qualify it. Mm -hmm. It was only about a layer deep, I couldn't qualify it. People who were, who were, who were intelligent and not afraid to confront me would say, how do you qualify this? Yeah. And of course, as I was writing it, it was revealing itself to me as well as saying, this does work, but you can't qualify it. And you don't even understand what you're doing. You don't even understand causation. So then I started to go into it deeper and I thought, okay, uh, preemption works. I've, I've beat people, I've been in hundreds of fights. It's, it's so effective that I've got to stop doing it because it's so effective. But there must be something deeper. There must be a preemption before that. So I kept, re, re, I kept going backwards, deeper and deeper, until I realized that these monsters on the door were monsters of my own creation. Yeah. I'd got this parasite in me that was afraid, and it was projecting these monsters. And I was literally seeing them in three dimensions and then creating tools to defeat the very monsters that I'd created and forgotten. So I, I was actually physically creating them. So this, this energy that I'd been access to as a kid, that we're always access, all of us are access to, was coming through dark filters. It was coming through a particular dark filter. So if this energy comes through clean and goes out clean, miracles. We right. see literal miracles. If it comes through a dark filter we, uh, filter, we still see miracles, but they're miracles of a dark nature. They go out into the world. They create in the world of causation. They create, and there's an effect of those creation, those creations. So uh, I started to look and thought, oh, it's me. It's me that's creating these monsters. It's my projection. So I, that this is where I went from the uh, lesser jihad, which was the door, yep. to the greater jihad, which was going in and finding this parasite, because this parasite was hijacking my divine energy. And it was you, and it was being, and, and it was being filtered through this and projected out into the world and creating more and more monsters. Yep. So I recognise that this parasite, uh, this parasite's in most people every day, or these parasites, and they've been in us, as uh, Krishnamurti would say, for thousands of years. That's why they're so difficult to get out. They're inherited. They're passed down without, you know, the genetic inheritance or the yep. genetic curse. So they've been around for a long time, but I had a particular parasite in me, a particular one that had stolen my kingdom. Yeah. It stolen my will. Now it, was, now it was working through me to be physical. This guy has disrespected you, knock him out. That guy is a threat. Be afraid of him, knock him out. You know, this situation is dangerous. Run away from it or hit somebody. So I started to go inwards and I recognized oh, through the writing and through the talking, I recognized that the main parasite was implanted in me at the age of 11 and it had grown fat on my attention and I wasn't going to get it out with a judo throw, with a strangle. I wasn't going to get it out with a big right cross. I needed a bigger remedy. The remedy I got was um, one of the uh, 99 names of Allah from the, from the Holy Quran, compassion. Yep. Compassion. So I was shown, I was shown that Compassion, love, is the only way. It's not like um, uh, it's not like let's be kind and let this guy off. It was actually a remedy. It was an antivirus. So I got a virus in me, and compassion was the antivirus. So I recognised this again. It came down as hakama. It came down as a bit of wisdom. Unpack this. Unpack it. You know, expand it. Go into the depths of it. Um. When I was ready to start looking at that and start to understand it and recognize that the physical wouldn't get rid of that parasite because it fed on physical. Yeah, it yeah. wouldn't get rid of that drama because it fed on drama. 
It wouldn't get rid of the pain because it fed on pain. It, I couldn't get rid of the violence because it fed on violence. If you look at Eckhart Tolle's um, seminal book, The Power of Now, he's probably the best book in the world for this technique of finding joy or compassion um, or understanding or whatever, whatever it is. The remedy for me was compassion. So I suddenly found myself face to face with this guy that abused me when I was 11 in the cafeteria in Coventry. That, that's, I realised immediately just, that the, just, the physical to, wouldn't work. You no, know, just to jump in here, uh, to set this next part up, and apologies for interrupting you, but the story that you're about to tell here, I, I watched, I don't know, there's videos on this and on YouTube and on, on the internet five, six, seven times, and uh, I'll, I'll, I'll let you tell the story now, but I, I feel blessed that you're actually sitting in front of me today so that I can maybe unpack this because yeah. this was one of the most powerful, this is probably the most powerful story that's appeared on the podcast so far, what, you're just, what I know you're just about to talk about. Uh, so yeah, go ahead and then maybe I'll have more questions to un yeah, unpack. But this, this was quite unbelievable to me. So I was talking about, I wanted to access a higher power. I wanted to be a vessel for a higher power. I knew the limitations of the physical. I'd, I'd got a good degree of control of the physical and I was dealing with life and death situations, but I knew it was a grain of sand on a thousand beaches. I wanted to understand more. So um, God or the universe placed me in proximity with the person that abused me. So I was in a cafe. I was 16 stone. I was a lump. I, was, I had all my skills, all my physical skills. I looked across and there he was. And I knew immediately, the I was in the environment. The environment says, you want to hire power? You want to, get, you want to go into the budo? This is a chance. And the environment taught me again. As soon as I looked over at him, all of my physical skills fell away. I wasn't 16 stone. I wasn't a fifth dam. I was uh, an 11-year-old boy again. And I knew, I absolutely knew, that the physical, if I was physical with this guy, which I was capable of being, because that was my, that was, uh, you know, that's what I turned to. And that's what I developed. Uh, I knew that I would, even if I killed him, I would, I would, especially if I killed him, I would feed the parasite in me. Yeah. I recognize, as the rabbis say, when you see somebody that's harmed, you run after them and serve them because they have something of yours. And you need to get it back. And they've given you something and you need to give them back, that back. So I didn't recognize this consciously. I only recognized that the physical it would only feed what was in me. And I needed to get rid of what was in me. But, I, I, but my, my chair was like a dugout. Um, and stepping out of the chair I felt like I was going over the top. And this few yards between me and him felt like no man's land. Yep. That's how terrifying it was. There's no exaggeration. I was terrified. I was trembling from my toes right to my scalp. And I just thought, well, no one would know if I walked away because nobody really, uh, you know, the story wasn't widely shared. No one knew who the guy was. I could get away with that. But I knew I would know. And I knew that my, my dharma in this life is to confront fear, to dissolve fear, and leave my lessons in the marketplace, as Rumi would say. Leave my less messages in the, in the marketplace for other people that might want to learn. <clears throat> so I did what I always do. I stepped up, I walked across, and I stood in front of him. But I was so emotional. I was shaking, and I was, it was rage. There was emotion. I was so angry, but so I could have cried at any minute. And I just said to him, listen, you don't remember me, but <clears throat> when I was a kid, you uh, groomed me and abused me. I said, and you fucked my life. And he went to stand up and I said, sit down. It was like, a, he felt my certainty. Mm -hmm. He sat down and I said, you, you damaged me when I was a kid. And I said, you need to know that I forgive you. I forgive you. And I said it to him twice because I needed to reiterate it. <clears throat> and I felt all the fear fall away because I looked at him and he was crushed. He was just crushed. As I went to walk away, he stood up and he put his hand down. His fingers were trembling like that. And I didn't realize what was happening at the time. I only knew it was, it was beyond the handshake. It was nothing really to do with the handshake. 
he wanted me to shake hands and say, you know, I accept your forgiveness or thank you for your forgiveness. Um, but I knew there was something more than that. And I've, it's only in the last year that I've realised what it was. But I shook his hand and that was the moment I separated the bond between me and him. So even though we were separated by 30 years and even though <clears throat> we were separated geographically, he was still feeding off me. Every time he rose in me as an anger, as a fear, as a lust, as a dissonance, he fed off me. And a greater energy than us fed off him and fed off me. He was a victim too. And I knew that by forgiving him, by finding compassion, by recognising that he, he was going to have to pay for what he did, I knew that compassion would be an antivirus. Um, but I recognised many years later that when he, when he put his hand out to shake my hand, that was him unconsciously saying, um, thank you for letting me go and I'm going to let you go. I'm going to, I'm going to accept this separation, this bond separation, so that I can go off and repent and you can go off and repair. Both of us were doing the same thing. Repentance means to return to the centre, means repair. And, and repair means repentance. It means to return to the centre. But he was able to return to the centre <clears throat> if he was brave enough to repent. And I was going to be able to return to the centre if I was brave enough to repair and look at this wound. So I walked off. And that was the very, very beginning of my journey into Budo, proper metaphysical power. Of course, nobody understood forgiveness. Nobody understood that we don't have the power to forgive. We only have the power to give it over to reciprocity, to the law of compensation, to God. We don't have the power to um, forgive. That's not a human trait. That's a divine attribute. But we, we are able to draw down compassion, which separates the bond, and then wisdom, which enables us to say, well, if I give this over to reciprocity, reciprocity will settle its own accounts. And that's what I did. And that was over the next 40 years, I've been able to unpack that. I've just written a book called 99 Reasons to Forgive, inspired by the 99 names of Allah um, from the Holy Quran. Um, originally, it was inspired, I was going to call it 13 Reasons to Forgive, which was based on the, the book by my, my Monides um, and his 13 Precepts of uh, Grace. Uh, but it only ended up as 99 reasons to forgive because that forced me to study um, Al-Ghazali and some of the other great imams and to really look at um, what these names were, what the 99 names were, what the attributes were, what these remedies were. And I was realising if I take the remedy of compassion, and that's one of the 99 names. Of course, it contains all of the 99 names. Yeah. If, I've got, if I've got a seed of God, it contains all of God. It just needs to be uh, fertilized, put in fertile ground. So just the power, the power to stand in front of somebody and find compassion, even though they've hurt you, is proper, full-on Budo. That's why I'm still excited about the martial arts. Someone said to me recently, what does your martial arts look like now? I said, it looks just like this. Yeah. This is the power of it. And this is beyond dogma. This is beyond people's idea of what religion is. This is kind of saying this arcana, this knowledge, these remedies, these attributes are there for us all, but we, but we get scared away by the house ghosts of uh, popular opinion. People say, oh, it's, you know, religion is the cause of all wars, but it's not. People are the cause of all wars. Ignorance is the cause of all wars. Religion from the root word just means to realign, relegari, to reattach to reattach to our source. Um, and, and we can align to anything, can't we? People align to violence, people align to ignorance. Um, but my thing is to align to love. And that's, you know, that's what I've learned from going into, by going beyond the house ghost of dogma and going into the exegesis. And the, the ex, not, just the, not just looking at the books, but looking at the exegesis of the books and then looking at the commentary on the exegesis. And then looking at the offshoots that, you know, you go into, say, if you go into the Quran and then you start looking at Al-Ghazali, you start looking at Rumi or Hafiz and you go, fucking hell, this yeah. is, there's so much here. Yeah. And they're all saying the same thing, whether you're looking at Hindu or Christian or Sikh or Islam or, or Judaism, um, you know, Zoroastrianism, same thing. 
you know, you've got problems, you can't fix them, surrender to me, come yeah. back to the center. Science, find the singularity, find the quantum vacuum, yeah. find the geometric point, stay in that point. Everything will be solved. Everything is known from the center. <clears throat> so that was the beginning of me really going heavily into Budo. Because, yeah. of course, you know, I, was, I went on the door. I was abused at 11. Between the ages of 11 and 40 or 45, um, this parasite had worked in me. Um, and it acted through me. So I've created a lot of bad karma in the world. Yeah. Um, and that karma was coming back. It does. It's a boomerang. It comes back and it's also stored. There's a lovely line in the, um, there's a lovely line in the Quran where it says, um, in the next, <coughs> in the next life, there will be uh, a room with two queues and the long queue is for excuse makers. Um, and God will walk up and down the queue and he will ask you, what did you do with the money I gave you? You know, do you remember that, you know, for every difficulty we gave you one easy? You know, account for yourself and don't lie because even your skin will speak a testimony against you. It's stored in us. It's saying, don't be an excuse maker. You've got the chance now. And of course, what, when they talk about in the next life, in the next world, they're not really talking about beyond death. They talk, the next world is the, is the world we experience beyond ignorance. Yeah. The moment I, the moment I um, dissolve and convert a fear and ignorance, I'm automatically into a new world. So in the new world, the reward comes. So the idea then was like, okay, I've got 40 years of abuse in me, you know, 40 years of violence. <clears throat> that needs to be unpacked. That needs to be brought out. Um, I think Carl Jung would call it individuation. We've got to bring up from the unconscious into the conscious and process it. So I did that through 50 books, 15 films, yeah. thousands of articles, a million talks. And still now, I'm, I'm, the, you know, the, your ego will go, another, another podcast? You know, how many times are you going to tell this story? But every time I tell it, I learn something new. Yeah. Learning something new again about, you know, this more and more of it's unpacking because of what I'm saying now. So the writing took me through a, I've just had five years of very severe regeneration. Because I, all of those, all of those violent, episodes they don't go away you don't have an epiphany and go oh you know praise the lord you know everything's clean it's not you know you, you've got to look at all that stuff repentance first of all means to acknowledge what you've done wrong and look at it first thing you do is you go i'm not going to do that again second thing you do is you have to repair what you've broken and that process for me was uh, through brutal honesty through um self-awareness self-criticism and writing stuff down, bringing it to a public space, bringing it to light. What we bring to light becomes light. So in other words, this, this energy that came through me has picked up a dark filter. So it's gone out into the world as a dark spirit. Yeah. And when I repent, I'm able to convert that back to good spirit. So, so, that, so that was the process. The, the, the solution to you at a time was to face the fear, uh, go on the doors, and then you've, you've explained how that led to, led you down a, a, a worse pass, a path, yeah. sorry, in many ways. Uh, so what you thought was the solution morphed into a different type of problem, I guess. Yeah. So what, what, what happened when you, what, can you give us a point where you said, I'm walking away from this and then, in my head, and you might correct this, from when you walked away from the doors to sitting with me this morning, uh, seems to be when your your best work has been done. Ah, oh, thank you. Uh, your your and again, you can take best to mean a number of things. Uh, some people might still go back to the books, uh, watch my back, all this sort of the the previous stuff, but is it, am, I, am I right in thinking that you're happier times, you're, you're more proud of the work you've done since you left the door work? Is that right? Or? Uh, yeah, I'm kind of proud of them both, really. <clears throat> because although that other stuff was dark, um, you know, not everybody's exactly where I am. So someone, you know, I still get letters from people saying, 
you know, watching my back has encouraged me to overcome my fears. Um, and that film you did, I know you're not there anymore, Jeff, but that, that has really helped me because it's where I am. Um, so I don't want to dismiss, you know, like if you look at Miller Reaper, murderer turned saint. If you look at Angulimala, Buddhist murderer, 99 deaths, used to wear the fingers of his victims around his neck. 99 people he killed before the Buddha converted him. And then you look at St. Paul, you know, um, uh, um, crucified the Christians, hated Christ, has a moment of clarity on um, the road to Damascus and becomes the most prolific writer in the New Testament. You know, um, there are examples throughout all of our faiths of people who are very, very extreme criminals who went on to become saints. And there are certain people in the world that won't listen to anybody but St. Paul. And they listen to Paul because of where he come from. They'll, they'll listen to Milarepa because he killed 35 people in a revenge attack. They'll listen to Angulimala because Angulimala was, a, you know, was, was trying to kill a thousand people. He wanted to kill a thousand people. So people need, they need people like me. You know, I went down that wrong path. Um, that wrong path is serving me. Because it enables me to say, you know, I can talk to kids in prison and say, listen, I know you think this is solving the problems, but I've done that. And believe me, it's not. You know, if you've got a rifle or a gun or a knife or you've got violence in your mind, it's the weakest. That's the weakest end of the whole spectrum. The highest end is when you can reach this frequency of love and compassion. So I think they're necessary. It's necessary for people to go, well, if he says it's true, I'm going to listen. You know, and I'm not just saying it because I'm qualifying it. I'm saying this is how I'm qualifying it. But I'm also saying um, it's qualified in your books as well. I don't just mean it by looking at the revealed books. I'm on about looking at the hidden books, mm -hmm. you know, going into the exegesis, going into the explanation of the books, doing a study of the books. All of the books give you the answers. They all have the remedies. It's all there. So it's kind of saying from my experience, um, I went heavily down the wrong path but that enables me you know the the, the worse i was the more opportunity i've got to yeah, ascend yeah. You know, so the it's what they in the christian church they say the bigger the sinner the greater the welcome because there's so much darkness there to convert into light there's so much oil for the lamp but i would i would agree with that the work that's coming through now is much cleaner it's much less much less egoic most of it i don't recognize as my own um things like the divine CEO that downloaded into my head, 20 chapters downloaded loaded into my head on a walk. And I just wrote what I was given. So I'm, I became a vessel for it. I didn't know most of that stuff. All it did was pick up my stories and my flavors, but all of the arcana in there, I didn't know. Um, the div and, and notes from a factory floor, all my stories, but there's a divinity going all the way through it. That is not mine. If that book works or those book works, it's not because of me. And I'm not being falsely modest. I know the difference. So uh, the stuff coming through now um, is, you know, clean. It's much cleaner. I'm obviously still working on that to get to become a cleaner vessel. Um, but things like Romans, I think it's called Retaliation in the States. I film I did yeah. for Orlando Bloom. Yeah. It's rippling with divinity. It's all the way through it, you know. Uh, I did a film for a guy called James Cosmo called The Pyramid Text. Same thing. Nobody can quite articulate why, but it's beautiful. But you know why it's beautiful, Kareem? Because <clears throat> it's talking about fear. And do you know what fear is? The only fear. What do you think the only fear is? Well, it's, it's as if this has been uh, set up because I was just looking at my, I quickly looked at my notes there and uh, I, I, I've written fear with a big circle around it because that's one of the main themes that, that I really wanted to talk to you about. Uh, yeah. I'm going to say I don't know because it, 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 I want you to educate me rather than yeah. me. I don't the, know. The, the, I only, don't know the, the, only, the only the only true real fear, and this is why fear is so associated with love. I met with a couple of uh, Jewish guys who, who came, a couple of Jewish guys came to my screening. They're quite mysterious guys. They took us for dinner. Very beautiful men. Um, took us for dinner. You know, sometimes they say you meet angels, but you don't know until afterwards. Yeah. You know, I, I will visit you, but you won't, you won't recognize them until afterwards. 
kept saying, this fear, this, this fear thing you're writing about, it's important. It's important. It's very important that you write about this. You're writing about it from all the different faiths, but it's very important that you write about it. Because people will talk about sex and pornography, they won't talk about fear. And I didn't realize what he meant at the time, but I understood. Um, if you look at Julian of Norwich, she said she had an amazing epiphany where she had a, a exposure to God. And she said, our only fear, our only fear, is the fear of disconnection from God or the disconnection from our source. Um, and that was our only fear. So all of, you know, when people think fear is good or think fear is bad, fear is, fear is just a sign that we are disconnected from our source. So fear is love because we, we love our source or we love God so much that we're afraid to be away from the nurturing <clears throat> essence of God. So we're afraid to be away from that because we know that if we were away from it, um, we're like a, we're like a transistor radio with a tiny battery. It's going to wear out after a day. We need to be plugged into the mains electric. So our only fear is a fear of disconnection from the source. So fear is a good thing because it's an alarm system. It says you're feeling fear because you've fallen out of the center. You've disconnected. And it doesn't matter if you did, you know, people talk about small crimes, big crimes, but they're all the same. The degree doesn't matter. If I sit and assassinate somebody over a coffee at Costa, I've disconnected from God just as much as if I murdered somebody. Because mm -hmm. disconnection is disconnection. Either I'm plugged in or I'm not plugged in. So the only difference in degree is that if I murder somebody, the consequences in the world of form may be, may be greater. But the consequences of disconnecting from our source are the same, whether it's a small anomaly or a big anomaly, whether it's a small um, failure or a big failure. So once you understand that, especially if you read somebody like Al Ghazali, Al Ghazali was fanatical about not gossiping, not even to process, because he said it very, very quickly disconnects you from God because it's salacious. Mm -hmm. He said, you're murdering somebody's character. He said, you're, he'd say, he's, the, the old rabbis would say, you're actually drawing blood yeah. because if, if somebody finds out and they hear about it, the blood rushes to their head because they're embarrassed or they're ashamed or they're angry. Mm -hmm. So once you start getting into the budo, you have to be, you have to be aware all the time of that what you think and what you say and what you do need to be congruent. This is real martial arts. This is the martial arts of Funakashi. This is the martial arts of Kano. This is the martial arts of Ushiba. This is the martial arts of Musashi. Um, you know, Musashi was obviously, a, I used to say he was a samurai, a ronin samurai. My wife said he was a serial killer. <laughs> Just <laughs> different, my, my, different ways of looking at the same thing. But, you know, it's, the, it's this sense that they all found that. Ushiba was the best example of it because he's very, very recent. You know, he was still alive, um, I think, up to the 1940s or 50s. And there's a lot of good books out there about him. Um, so the sense of um, I'm either in the Budo or I'm not in the Budo. If I disconnect from the Budo to fiddle a penny from my tax, I might as well have fiddled a million pounds because I'm disconnected. So the, the key then is to recognize Budo or kindness or love or compassion, any of these names, um, and stay in it. So it's, the Christians call it being in constant prayer. Um, um, Ushiba would just say that we are in constant practice. We, we never leave the center. We are connected to that universal key or chi, as we would call it, all the time. So it doesn't really matter what the labels are, because once you go beyond, once you, once you go beyond, um, once you reach the proximity, once you're close to the center, all names um, have, no, have no, no relevance at all. There's no, there's no sound, there's no talking, there's no denomination. Um, there's none of that in the center. This is what the Buddha found. The Buddha was asked by one of his students what he'd found. He said, consciousness has freed me from denotation. So in other words, I'm not looking at a man or a woman. I'm not looking at um, a Muhammad or a Christ. I'm not looking at um, uh, a car or, or a house. I'm just looking at energy forms with no names, no denotations. I'm just looking at pure energy. All of it has, has slowed down and formed into, uh, into a material thing. And all of it will eventually break down and dissipate again. We are the inlet and the outlet for this energy, but we have filters called perceptions, 
cognitions, beliefs, conceptualizations. So the energy comes to a concept, the concept creates a form, the form creates an aspect, and that's what we think it is. But actually, it's just energy made into a form by us. So if we make it into a form, that means we can change the perception, we can change the cognition, we can change the conceptualization. Um, and when we do that, then we start to, uh, you know, we start to form our own reality. Um, in what did they? What was that lovely line? Um, on earth as it is in heaven, our kingdom come. Our will be your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. From the from the Christian prayer, but it's basically saying that the 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 um, the hidden world and the revealed world will be the same. Mm -hmm. It'll be exactly the same because the energy coming in will be coming out exactly the same as much as we can. Because obviously it's, all, it's always got to come through. It's always got to come through a filter. It's always got to come through language and language and allegory and, um, you know, concept. It's always going to be fault. There's always going to be faults in it. So we do our best with it. The best stuff is, um, is just knowing that while you're cleaning and while you're finding the center, you're going to be benefiting the world. Because just if you're just in the room with people, even if they don't know you, the world, that room will benefit and the world will benefit just because you've lifted your level of consciousness, just because you've done some cleaning. The, the, I'm not, I wouldn't suggest that winning a BAFTA or working with a sort of Hollywood superstar like Orlando Bloom uh, in your new movie, uh, is any is, is is a better experience than anything that you've sort of experienced before? I wouldn't like to categorise them like that, and, and especially after now having chatted to you, I don't think you would either. I don't think you would no. say my experience with someone in the street is less valuable than my experience dealing with Orlando Bloom. Uh, but did you ever did you ever think as a young boy growing up in Coventry? Going through what you went through, your life would would, would be in this place now, all of these years later. And and no. I would think that that word fear again is the one hurdle. What I'm trying to say is, there's so many people out there that might not get what they truly could because they're scared. Yeah, I'm scared of stuff. I mean, there's there's what one of the things that I talk about often is we still teach our classes from. Uh, from council facilities and et cetera, et cetera. And yeah. my dream every day is to have a, a full-time martial arts school, et cetera. And there's, a, there's, a, there's still a fear. There's, everybody you pass in the street must have fear. Yeah. How, if you've spoke extensively on this, but could you bring this in just to like a, a, a sort of succinct bit of advice maybe you can't how people should face that fear how do you get over that you got over a hurdle that that was to the, an extreme uh, being abused as a child people might not even encounter something as as disturbing or as tragic as that but they still can't get over that that hurdle how how yeah. do you do that how do we <clears throat> i would i would say that first of all you've got to if, if you want to make it, make it a, a bit easier, we've got to get rid of all the things that are feeding fear. So don't forget that fear resides, you know, this fear resides in us because we've fallen out of center. If we've fallen out of center, then we contain a parasite. And the parasite can be a cognition or a belief. It doesn't really matter. It's in the body. And the moment you try to go past that, it stops you with terror. And it stops you with terror because it knows that if you're going to cross that hurdle, it will be consumed in the volition of your action. It will, it will, it, you know, it will be um, transitioned. So it will die. So it will no longer be what it is. The fear will be liberated. The energy will be um, brought over into consciousness. So these energies will, are there to either claim you or be claimed. They're, they are the thorns and the fire around the kingdom or around the will. So they're meant to be there. They're ordained and they need to be converted. It's a bit like if you look at a light bulb, you've got a, a, um, a positive pole and a negative pole and the element in the middle creates light. So you couldn't go 
if only I didn't have that negative pole, I could create light. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, you need yeah. that negative pole. So, but what we have to do is we, we have to recognize that negative, positive and negative are, are impotent without the element in the middle. And the element is our will. That's why they call the will the kingdom. So when we enter the land, but when we enter the kingdom, it means we enter our own will. We take control of our own will. When we take control of our own will, we no longer take instruction from the world of form. We take instruction from the soul, from the inner tutor, from intuition. And the soul says, open a centre here, Kareem, because these kids need what you've got. Be an example. Show them how to do it. Um, they're going to need to overcome fear. Um, and you can't show them how to do that if you can't do it yourself. So you open your full-time centre. Yeah. Assistance will come. You will get Dharma protectors. The money will come. What you need will come. If you do everything that's possible, all the stuff that's impossible will be done for you. But you can't teach them how to overcome fear if you haven't done it and you're not actively doing it. Yeah. So Rumi said, never take instructions from someone who's never left home. Indeed. <laughs> so we have to recognise, first of all, we can stop feeding the parasite in us by, you know, like if you watch the news in the morning, there are 20 horror stories. 20 horror stories before you even eat your breakfast. That's food. That's feeding a parasite. We don't have to watch all that. We don't have to watch violent films. We don't have to watch violent videos. We don't have to have violent conversations. We don't need to be in violent conversations. And if we're sitting gossiping about somebody, that's subtle violence. If we have unqualified opinions about somebody, that's violence. Again, if you look into the exegesis of all of the great books, they all tell you the same. We do harm every single day 200 times a day not just to the people out there but to us because we have to process that if i harm you with a negative thought or a negative word i have to process that through trillions and trillions of cells my cells are incarnated with the caustic of that unqualified and unkindness so first of all you can lessen that fear by getting closer to your source you get closer to your source by getting rid of everything that isn't source. Uh, they call this apophatic theology. It sounds fancy, but it really, it just really means finding the center via negation. I don't know what the center is. I can't identify it. I can't, I can experience it, but I can't articulate it. But I know what it's not. So if I start to get rid of all the things it's not, then I will eventually, not, I'm not searching for what is real, because what is real is always there. It's a folly to search for it. All I'm doing is revealing it. All I'm doing is moving a cloud away from the sun and, and showing you what is already there. Like Richard Rose would say, look at the sun. It's one of the biggest stars in the orbit. But you get a tiny penny and put it in front of it, you can block the whole sun with as much as a rusty penny. Yep. So the idea is we get rid of the things that are feeding fear and obscuring love. So fear isn't real. Fear is, just a, fear is actually love. Fear is love of God, love of our source, and recognizing that we are disconnected from it if we're feeling too much fear it's because we're not close to the center so we have to get the proximity we can get rid of we can get to the proximity by getting rid of all of the things that take us outside of proximity don't remember don't forget when we overeat we feed fear when we overdrink, we feed fear when we take in any any kind of narcotic we feed in fear you know when we take in negative information even if it's just from the environment that's, that information is food, comes in and it, the, it, it actually becomes flesh. So what I did was I just started to one by one go, okay, I don't know who the self is. I don't know what the singularity is. I don't know what God is, but I know what it's not. I know it's not jealousy. I know it's not anger. I know it's not fear. I know it's not violence. I know it's not judgment. I know it's not gossip. How powerful am I, Karim? If I'm a, an eighth fan, then I can't stop myself from gossiping. How, if I can't even control this tiny organ here, how powerful am I, really? How powerful am I if I can't even resist a second pudding? If I take my clothes off and look in the mirror and look at myself, if I can't even control my palate, how powerful am I? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I remember being a fifth fan and looking in the mirror as a master grade and thinking I was forced to overweight, I was addicted to sexual pornography, I was violent, I was a bully, all of these things I'd rationalized. And when I got my fifth down, I saw it. It was a slap across the face. Yeah. It's not a judgment on people, it's just saying we can start local. Yeah. 
You want an esoteric exercise? Just be kind for 24 hours. Don't have a bad opinion about somebody. Don't have a negative opinion. We've got, we got too many things wrong with ourselves to worry about what Trump's doing in America. We've got too, we, you know, we've got too many things to fix on ourselves before we need to worry about how many children Boris has got. We've got to get our own stuff right. We've got to, we've got to make ourselves the 10% that lift everybody else. And we can do that by correcting our palate. And our palate is what we eat, what we drink, you know, uh, what we ingest, what we read, what we see, what we hear. It's all of those things. So it's starting to, to we lessen the fear by reducing the things that feed fear. And as we reduce the things that feed fear, and this is what I call expansion through contraction. We contract the ego, the egoic feed. We expand consciousness. When we start to practice things like meditation, when we start to practice things like prayer or, or religious study or, um, you know, kindness, charities, especially anonymous charities, when we start to do that kind of thing, we expand consciousness. When we expand consciousness, it automatically contracts egoic activity. So when we contract, we expand. When we expand, we contract. These are things we can do every day just by resisting a second pudding. Because we got this idea that it doesn't, it doesn't really matter. But how did Gandhi become one of the most powerful influences in the history of our species? Through palate. He said, when you control the palate, the senses fall into alignment. When you control the senses, you control the self. Once you control yourself, you control the world. Because it's, you've no longer got this divine energy rushing through negative filters. It's only coming through one filter. And that one filter is, I want to serve God. I want to serve the source. I want to serve um, uh, the singularity, the soul, the self. I want, I want to serve kindness. Whatever word you want to put to it. You know, there are 99 names for Allah, but of course we know that there are infinite names and they all come from the same root, which is kindness or compassion would be more accurate. So the idea is we get rid of everything in our life that's not kind. Yeah. And then as we get rid of everything that's not kind, we get closer to the source. The fear can't exist anywhere near the source. If we're feeling fear, it's because of love. It's because we love being at the source and the fear is saying, oh, Jeff, you're feeling these feelings because you've, thought you've fallen for a conception and it's created a form and an aspect and you've pulled you away from the center or you've been pulled away by ambition or by lust or by greed or by judgment. So we come to the center. And those teachers, the moment we start heading towards the center the teachers will appear because anybody that turns into fear instead of turning away is heading back home not heading away from home and the assistants will rush to you it will rush to you like water to a leak in a pipe you know so it's it's i would say that and um you've got to be the proof yourself you know you've got to be you've got to actually confront these things and challenge them and intercourse with them and absorb 99 percent of them and then they won't just, they won't just uh, give up their tendency. They will talk to you. They will talk to you. They have a voice. And they'll go, oh, yeah, you found out. You found out who we are. We're really just from God. We're God's master swordsman. We've come to teach you how to use your weapons. We've come to teach you how to find your center. And this is, well, this is the message that we want to impart. So, so depression and fear is not a harbinger of doom. It's a messenger of hope. It's saying, you, know, you wouldn't feel this. You are not seen if you're center, in the center. Al-Ghazali said, if you fall out of center, you are seen. It doesn't mean you're seen by anybody good. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> you are seen. But uh, and he said, and if you are in the center, that's Harry Potter's invisible cloak. We are in the center. Sit next to the CEO. Nobody will mess about with that. But to get to the CEO, as Rumi said, love is not a subtle argument. The door there is devastation. In order to get to love, we have to devastate everything that's not love. But of course, you know, that affects everything. Everything affects everything. So it's very exciting. And the challenge never goes outside of you. It's right there. It's right with you now. The person you're waking up with in the morning is your, is your guru. You know, the students around you, the circumstances, the environment. Even the wood beams will talk to you. You know, even the floor tiles will talk to you once you start to recognize that he's in everything. I mean, and I'm not talking metaphorically, I'm talking literally. Yeah, of course. And it will all, all of it will communicate with you. So if you don't want fear, 
get rid of everything that feeds fear. And it's so subtle, we don't even know we're doing it. We're thinking, I'm watching the news four or five hours a day because they want to keep informed. We, don't, we only have to look out the window to keep informed. No. We, you know, we'd have to be stupid not to be informed. But when you're taking that stuff in every single day, and, it, and it's, a lot of it is hideous. You know, I've got friends, I've got friends who work in Sky and they say, you know, their, their thing is, if it bleeds, it leads. Yeah, of course. I've got friends who work, work in the media and they just, they said they've got to get out of it because it sickens them because mm -hmm. it's like, they don't want the good news stories. They don't want it. They just want stuff that sates the appetite of, of people that are feeding off negative energy. Yeah. But they don't even know they're feeding off negative energy because they've not, they've not really done the rigor. And the, the good thing about the martial arts is you're saying if you tip into Budo, um, that's where the rigor is. It's, we go from the um, exoteric to the esoteric from the external to the internal. Wonderful. Uh, as I say, to, to just have you on the podcast today has been, uh, it's just been a blessing. For what, want a better word, actually, for what we've, we've, been, we've been talking about. Uh, I'm aware of your time, Jeff. I know it's still early in the morning, but you're away to uh, go on with your day. So we'll, we'll finish it there, if that's okay with you, sir. Yeah, yeah. Uh, honestly, I can't thank you enough. As I say, we'll get... We'll get it up on our usual YouTube channel and on iTunes and et cetera, et cetera. But it's been an absolute pleasure to, to speak with you. And, and I, I genuinely can't, can't thank you enough for coming on. Uh, no, thank you for inviting me. And, and we'll, we'll push it through our Instagram and we'll do everything to get it out there. Right. And I really appreciate it as well. Because every time we've just done about an hour and a half. Yeah. <laughs> that's in the can. That's in the can. I know it's gone, hasn't it? We just yeah. heard it. But that's in the can. That's out there now. That's going to work for kids way beyond us that'll be out there in the ether it'll be out there and there'll be kids that'll be able to watch that who will hear something in this that will act as an intercessor so once it's recorded it's done it's there and we've got it and you know and it's and it's going to help people out there that we probably will never meet yeah. we'll never hear from but it doesn't matter it's there and there's some anonymous kids going to pick it up at four in the morning who's suicidal and he's going to go I, I haven't heard that before i know and he's going to He's going to take one of our little avenues of inquiry and it's going to take him on a new path. Well, our job is just to put as many seeds out there for people to unpack as possible. Fantastic. Okay, sir, have a, have a wonderful day. Uh, I look forward to just following everything else that you're, you're doing at the moment. And if okay. you need me, just shout me through Gabriella. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of not active on the social media, but yeah. if I need anything, she, she lets me know. Perfect. Okay, sir, All God right. bless you. Have God a bless. great one. Take Thank care. You. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.